Hey, welcome to Tarmac. Today I'm at the Mass Powerhouse Museum in Sydney to have a look at the Reigning Men uh, fashion display that's in conjunction with Ferrari. So, uh, be interesting to see what this is all about. Some unusual fashions, some distinctive, distinctive icon stuff. So, should be, uh, should be quite some fun. Let's see what's inside here. Uh, so we've, uh, this is an exhibition uh, charting 300 years of men's fashion from 1715 to 2015 and it's drawn primarily from the Los Angeles County Museum of Arts collection which is exceptional and it's, it really is the largest and most comprehensive exhibition of men's fashion ever to be staged uh, anywhere in the world and uh, it's presented thematically in five themes so revolution, evolution, uh, east, west, uniformity, body consciousness, and the splendid man. So the first room uh, that you're seeing is the first part of the revolution evolution. And it's probably the most kind of historically kind of uh, uh, determined in, in the whole of the exhibition because the, the big catalyst in this room is the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was such a kind of turning point for a whole lot of reasons, but in terms of men's fashion, it really sort of marked a big turning point. Uh, and one of those turning points was the uh, before the French Revolution, fashionable men dressed in fancy silks and knee breeches, uh, and the working class man in France wore trousers and they wore linens and wools, uh, and uh, generally. Uh, and over the next two decades, the fashionable man would actually start to look a lot more like the working class man. And so part of that is, uh, part of this is that kind of uh, evolution uh, in response to the French Revolution. Uh, the fashionable man started working, looking like the, the working, working class, class man. man. Yeah, and you'll, <laughs> you'll see that evolution in this exhibition. Yeah. So the, the pre-revolutionary pre style of dress are those two uh, figures on the right. Uh, and as you can see, they're wearing knee breeches and uh, the, the figure on the left dates from about 1765, a typical fashionable English male. And uh, you'll notice he's got a slight paunch. And it was actually fashionable in the, uh, from the, really from the 16th century right through to the middle of the 18th century to have a little bit of a paunch because it showed that you were uh, wealthy enough to eat well. So I'm fashionable, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but towards the end of the 18th century, uh, uh, there was a, a kind of sea change in terms of what was considered a fashionable male figure. And that really was not so much to do with the revolutionary revolution, but more to do with a change in uh, values under the influence of the Enlightenment. Hi, Kat. Hi. Yeah. Uh, and so that... Figures like the Greek male statues, the classical Greek statues, suddenly became the ideal male figure. So slim hips, tall, athletic, broad chest. And so you can sort of see here in the space of 15 years how the fashionable male figure had changed. So this is someone from the uh, figure from the 1770s. This is a figure from the uh, 1775. This is 65. So 10, 15 years difference. Uh, so in this period of the late 18th century, saw incredible changes, mm. you know, just even before and during and after the revolution. So that's what this this whole kind of plinth is about. But what the exhibition does is it juxtaposes contemporary fashion with uh, historical dress. So the punks. Are the I main. love the punks. So it's yeah. one of my areas, and having all the badges and stuff like that yeah, on, you know. Yeah. So the punks were kind of like those. Uh, they, they punk was another kind of revolutionary moment in fashion, as we all know. Mm. So... Uh, that I'm, whole anarchy, that... Yeah. yeah. The complete rebellion, wasn't it? So, yeah, another yeah, rebellion. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And, and people are still kind of riffing off ideas that were developed by punks and, and designers mm. at the time, so... Shall we move yep. to the next one? <laughs> was that your look today? 
That was. Actually, I, I'm sort of dating back to the 1700s <laughs> and uh, punk. I'm a bit of a mixture between two. <laughs> I can see me really fitting in. <laughs> So this is just a selection of uh, male images from, mostly from our museum's own collection uh, from the 19th century through to the present day. We've also borrowed some images from contemporary photographers and also from different collections around the world just to kind of give people a sense of how men have looked over the ages. He's going to grow into that one at some point. I've got my, <laughs> I've got my son on one of those actually. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's me. <laughs> it's great. It's everything from sporting men to sort of hippies to new romantics and fetish wear. <laughs> um, military. He was at, Jake Gordon was at your opening night. Yes, wasn't he? yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was a he was one of Australia's most successful Indigenous models. Is that right? Yeah. I take it's not him with the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the exhibition continues with Revolution Evolution. Uh, so these are a sort of series of kind of youth trends dating from the 1920s right up to the present day. Uh, op uh, plus fours were very popular amongst um, uh, students at uh, university in the UK, particularly at Oxford, and um, the, um, the wide trousers, which were known as Oxford bags. The legend has it that um, students started to wear the plus fours to them to their mess halls, but they were forbidden from wearing them because the, the plus fours were actually more of a sporting style dress for golf and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's considered too informal. So the legend has it that students started to wear these wide trousers over their plus fours and then that in, in, uh, became a fashion in itself. Uh, and then you have a contemporary interpretation of that style. Um, one of the most interesting uh, outfits over here is um, the, is the zoot suit. Ah, oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't actually know where the word zoot comes from, but they were very popular in a very short number of years, the late 30s, early 40s, in America. Uh, very popular amongst African Americans, Latino Americans particularly, but also Jewish and, and some Asian Americans. And it, they were popular with men who kind of went to dance to bebop and jazz music. And uh, But they're also contentious because this was a time of um, rationing, fabric rationing, because of the Second World War. And so they're actually flouting those regulations. And so they caused quite a lot of kind of consternation amongst uh, different groups. So, and so to wear them was actually, you know, a kind of act of rebellion in itself. And there are reports of, of uh, gangs uh, ripping the, the, the clothes to shreds in anger, you know, uh, and okay. even the police chasing them with um, with batons um, stuck with razor blades. Oh, to slice them up. To slice them up. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, but the whole kind of look was about kind of being very flamboyant while you're dancing. Like even those pockets are actually only attached up here so that they kind of fly out as the dancer moves around. Gotcha. And the, the irony is that they're they're kind of legendary in kind of men's fashion, particularly in America but very few have survived. And so this particular suit was like highly contested at auction about seven years ago. Do you think they're going to come back in? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there are kind of designers who kind of do kind of baggy suits, not quite as exaggerated as, as yeah. that. I mean, Giorgio Armani's suits almost got that big at one stage, you know, <laughs> in the 80s. Uh, this is a section called the Dandy, and it's kind of like, uh, the complete opposite of the kind of male peacock. It's all about looking uh, very schmick and sort of understated. Uh, and that's kind of in, re in reaction partly to the excesses of the old regime prior to the French Revolution. So this is when, as I said before, you know how men start to adopt long trousers and they yeah. start to wear wools and plain colours and things like that. 
which really was a kind of uh, a style of working dress, but also a style of sporting dress, because this is this is what English gentlemen would wear to go riding. Right. Uh, and so both those influences kind of coalesced to make kind of modern menswear. So this is kind of like the genesis of the of the suit that we take granted today. Um, With the tails as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that comes from the writing yeah. uh, outfits. Yeah. This is more Enzo's era. Enzo. <laughs> Enzo Ferrari. Oh, right. Well, this is like from the 50s, early yeah. 50s. And this this was, a, this is not, what's the tailor called? A huntsman. This is a, a very famous Savile Row tailor. tailor. Uh, and this suit actually belongs to Gregory Peck's son. So Is that right? Uh, the suit was worn by Gregory Peck, and um, and Gregory Peck was a huge fan of Savile Row tailoring. He ordered over a hundred suits in his lifetime. Wow. Um, Giorgio Armani. Some Beatles era, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of like um, the hippie athlete era. That's Pucci there, that brown sort of psychedelic pattern. <laughs> and that red coat is, um, I think, by John Stevens from Carnegie Street in the 60s. It's very Lennon. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, this section looks at the kind of cultural kind of borrowings from East uh, by designers. Like one of the most, one of the most interesting stories that I didn't realise is the kind of genesis of the Hawaiian shirt. And I was actually, I already thought Magnum, <laughs> Thomas Magnum. I oh, was really? Saying. <laughs> uh, and Hawaiian shirts obviously yeah. come from Hawaii, but they actually came out of the uh, Japanese tailors who were working in Hawaii. Oh, uh, okay. And they started to uh, use uh, vintage kimono silks and recycle them as Hawaiian shirts. Right. And so the, the way the designs and prints are kind of very much still influenced by, you know, the Japanese kimono designs. So these are a whole body of work looking at the influence of uh, India and China and Japan uh, on... Uh, contemporary designers. This is a Dries van Noten uh, using the Paisley pattern, blowing up, you know, in larger scale, which comes from the Indian um, cashmere shawls, the Bote pattern. Uh, the, this is uh, the Nehru suit, which was popularised in the 1960s in the West, but was a kind of classic uh, garment worn by uh, the Prime Minister of, um, of India. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this is a Madras cotton that's been uh, made into a suit by Alcoton's uh, outfit by Vivian Westwood. Oh. And this section looks at the influence of uniforms and the kind of the way men have kind of dressed in kind of uniform styles. And one of the biggest influences on uh, the way we dress today is the military and naval uniforms. And again, these are slightly ad adapted from uh, riding dress from the 18th and 19th century, and it's wool as opposed to silk. And uh, the, in the interesting thing about wool, the difference between wearing wool and silk is that uh, wool you can actually mould to your body, and, and the skill of tailoring really kind of develops in the late 18th, early 19th century. And uh, so you can see the, the early 19th century uh, uh, uniforms were very very snugly tightly fitted so it was all about showing off that athletic body and the, the other interesting thing about uh, military and naval uniforms right up until the early 20th century is that they were often the officers uh, and some infantry actually had to uh, organize their own uniforms they had to get them made by the, their own tailors oh, right. and so there's often a lot of uh, variation in uh, in the uh, uniforms uh, like even this sailor's jumper here from the 19th century, American sailor's jumper, those sort of the, that sort of S-shaped pocket is a kind of little personal folly. I mean, they, they've been lined with a kind of red crushed velvet just to give a bit of individual touch to the hmm. to the uh, the top. 
A good old duffel coat. Yeah. Apparently it originated in Belgium. Belgium. Really? Yeah. This is the influence of MacArthur's uniform, General MacArthur, and uh, these kind of blues ons were very popular in the 1950s as a result. Uh, um, and the general rule in the like in the change from the 18th to the 19th century is that in the 18th century men wore a lot more colour, they wore a lot more sort of coloured silks and so forth. And but towards the 19th century, the colours start to sort of become sort of navy, brown, blue, black, uh, uh, until, you know, you get to the sort of 1950s where it's kind of grey. Yeah. Uh, but in the, in the, from the 19th century, or from the late 18th century onwards, as colour was disappearing from the kind of day outfits of men, the, the kind of what they wore at home could often be a little bit more colourful. Gotcha. So that's, that's what this kind of... Uh, plinth is about, you know, including that wonderful silk patchwork uh, dressing gown from the 1830s, this beautiful banyan, as it's called, this long coat and waistcoat from the 1730s, I think? 1720s. Um, That's a statement. This one here. Yeah. yeah, so this is by American designer, Californian designer, Rudy Gernreich, uh, and he was always trying to push the boundaries. He, he uh, is famous for inventing the topless swimsuit for women, um, a special G-string for men in the 1960s, uh, and also he was into unisex dressing, which was sort of a thing in the 60s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this was a caftan uh, that he designed that could be worn by men or women. Topless bikini, isn't that just bottoms? Oh, I know, I know. No, sorry, not topless, topless swimsuit. So it was a, it was a pant with straps that went up oh, right, between okay. the breasts, and that was it. Yeah, I miss those days. <laughs> um, looks at uh, the different types of kind of uniforms that men wear in kind of like day to day work. Like this is the evolution of the business suit. So this is what a uh, a typical sort of um, man would wear for business affairs in the 18th century and uh, in the 1850s or 1840, late 1840s. Uh, you can see how, um, you know, you go from the breeches to the trousers, but you also go from a little bit of colour and decoration, like this is a velvet with uh, brocaded rosebuds in it, and then you just go to pure black. And there's a little bit of whimsy in the waistcoat, uh, left and uh, really by the um, early 20th century uh, those kind of beautiful brocaded silks in men's waistcoats in the 19th century they're all gone it's, it's the only bit of personal expression left is your silk your tie, tie yeah. um, so this just looks at the way designers have tried to kind of reinterpret the business suit Giorgio Armani as we all know had a huge influence mm. And I didn't know this, but the curators were telling me that they, they were given a gift of like 100 Giorgio Armani pieces by this man who lived in LA who uh, was colorblind. And he, he told them that, and I didn't know this, but apparently Giorgio Armani, the way he kind of uh, did his colors was that he basically anything that he did in a season could, could sort of mix and match with anything else. So it's kind of like all the colours are kind of um, saturated to a point where they can all just mix. So I think everything's right? been greyed out. So yeah, yeah. he could put on any shirt with any suit and be confident that it wasn't yeah, going to look. Gonna... <laughs> yeah. That's quite a nice thing. Uh, That's a really good thing. Thing not to have to worry about. Yeah. I could take a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of learnings from that. <laughs> So this is just a different, all the different styles of formal wear, like from the 18th century, which is all about colour and glitz, to the um, late 20th century. It's just, you know, formal wear is just black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see here Tom Ford trying to kind of reintroduce a little bit of, uh, um, you know, whimsy back into the formal dinner suit. Yeah. 
Western look. Yeah, it's a Ralph Lauren. Oh, okay. Who kind of um, is responsible for sort of like making that look fashionable, you know, taking the kind of typical cowboy look. Um, the, on the left is actually an Australian label which we put in the exhibition. It's a Subi from 2001. And um, they uh, are, were essentially kind of jeans and t-shirt um, brand and they built their kind of reputation on the idea of customising. Right. And so as you can see, they've customised that pair of jeans and proposed turning it around back to front uh, uh, instead of uh, wearing it normally. They, and they've customised a dinner jacket and even a pair of Converse sneakers. Um, see an immediate problem with having your jeans around the wrong I way. know, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did man. Uh, which is all about different ways of kind of uh, looking splendid, whether it's glitter or fur or floral or colour. Um, and this section here looks at the uh, body consciousness. And it's very interesting because there's, there's a beautifully tailored 1840s coat here. And as I said before, the, the beauty of working with wool is that it can be really... Uh, sculpted to the body and in the early 19th century uh, the tailors really really steamed and and, and uh, molded the wool uh, directly to the to their clients bodies and you can yeah. see there's not a not an inch between the, the coat and the, and the body it's perfectly tailored and very snugly fit mm. uh, and that was something that the English really perfected and and uh, have really kind of still um, in Savile Row particularly sort of uh, led the way and there's an illustration of the way that the tailors not only kind of like sculpted the wool itself but also padded out the uh, the interior of the suit uh, and this was a kind of technique that lasted well into the 1920s uh, sort of give you so I don't even know what you call that part of the body I've got no muscles there but <laughs> obviously that coat will give you those muscles yeah, yeah. you know uh, this is a. Uh, this is from our own collection. This is a suit that uh, an outfit that was made by an Australian artist called David McDermott, who lived in New York, on and off in the late seventies and early eighties, and uh, would frequent this nightclub, the Paradise Garage, which was a legendary sort of. Like there was Studio Fifty Four at the time, uh, and right, the underground okay. equivalent of Studio Fifty Four was Paradise Garage, uh, and uh, it was basically a black and Latino club, but. Uh, it was considered one of the most influential nightclubs at this time. <laughs> and everyone would make an effort and dress up. So. <laughs> I love it. So what gave you the inspiration for the, for the whole The whole exhibition. The exhibition well, yeah. It emerges out of the Los Angeles County Museum of Arts collection. Yeah. And they bought a massive uh, collection from two Swiss dealers in 2007. Uh, sure. Like a thousand pieces men's, women's and children's. Yeah. And it was and the one of the stars of that collection was the menswear. Right. And they already had some beautiful eighteenth century menswear, but um uh so they realised that they, they basically ended up with the best menswear collection in the world. So that that was the beginning of that okay. project. Yeah. And I always think that that should be applied outside the workforce. My name is Tim Nicole Forward. I've grown up in Sydney my whole life. I grew up in Sutherland Shire. And um, one of the more interesting outfits in this section here is this pink suit, which belonged to um, a Congolese man called Willie Covery. And uh, he's uh, what you call a, a sapper. And a sapper is a French word for basically a kind of equivalent of a kind of dandy. And um, there's a whole culture of sapology in the Congo and it's about dressing up, showing that you're really kind of making it in the world and uh, surviving because right. it's so hard to survive in the Congo. So, uh, and it's not just uh, restricted to men, women and even children can kind of practice sapology. And, and in the videos here, we also interviewed a local uh, Sydney sapper and his family, okay. who talks about the, the philosophy of being a sapper, 
<laughs> and they really do put a lot, lot of effort into their training. Um, and this is just ending on a note here. What this last little section is called contemplating the future. You know, where will men's wear go from here? Sure. Um, they're just some propositions by contemporary designers. Um, it's quite a controversial title, though, isn't it? Raining men. In the, in the PC world that we're living in. Oh, moment. right, because it sounds so undemocratic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Well. I don't mind it, but yeah. by the way, I just think it's, yeah, it's it very... Well, it came out of the song. You know the song, It's Raining Men? Raining Men, yeah. Yeah, so then the curators um, sort of switched it to... To Raining, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just obviously the way that uh, the world is moving. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be more... Um, oh, well, we turn back to the, the sort of likes of the caftan, the it doesn't really matter, male, female... Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I or is it going to continue to be completely separated? Separate. I think it's always going to be. Uh, well, it's always hard to predict the future, but I hmm. can't see in any time soon men and women dressing exactly the same. But I think that there, there's there's a number of young men who are kind of pushing the boundaries at the moment, and I think that as men and women become more equal in terms of the power politics or whatever you want to call it in the sure. workplace and so forth. I think both get uh, gain some freedom from that. So uh, that's cool. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's the way yeah, the way things are gonna pan out. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean men men are kind of restricted as much as they are even though men presumably have more power in our society, there are more restrictions on the way they can behave. Hmm. And, and particularly the way they can dress. But if you look at all the futuristic videos that we're all wearing just one colour grey, yes. shiny suits of some yeah, sort yeah, that, yeah. that's sort of de-objectifying anything, really. Yeah, and that sounds horrendous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Mao Zedong, that's what they did. In yeah, China, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, welcome, really Dan. appreciate it. Not at all. Nice it's to meet very, you. Very, very good. Of course, the Ferrari Atelier. You may be able to dress well, but you've got to make sure that your Ferrari is dressed well too.